You're listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we are live. You let the stream breathe just for a couple of seconds. You guys know the drill. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, with me, as always, my partner in crime. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, first off, I hope you, you've had a great Monday. I'm curious to see. We'll play it for our, our awesome listeners and live viewers. But if you had a chance to see this uh, video the astronaut himself, Bradley Chubb, posted on Twitter, kind of flexing, kind of showing off how far he's come in his recovery from the ACL injury he had in week four. Yeah, he, I did I did catch that on Twitter. He looks good, and he looks like we've been saying he looks like, Chad, where ACL injuries nowadays, it's not like years past, where it was a debilitating injury for years and years and years. With modern medicine and technology, they've come a long way, and Bradley Chubb looks fresher than ever. He looks like the same as he did in 2018. And I expect that type of Bradley Chubb to come back. Obviously I'm not forming my basis or my taking my cues from this one little video. He has to prove it on the field as with every other player, but it's encouraging that he's putting this out and he's confident in his body to hold up after major surgery. So in case you guys missed it, we had this story. If, if, if you do miss it, you can either find him on uh, Twitter or go read the story at milehighhuddle.com. But I will sh- play for you, the, including the sound here. Bear with me one second. Let me back it up. Here's Bradley Chubb. All right, so you, you, you get the gist. And, Zach, what jumps out to me on this is simply that you get to see his rare combination of that size, speed, and power that he brings to the table that is very unique really who he reminds me of, and it's not apples to apples. Nobody get all uptight about this, but he reminds me of, and probably even in the minds of Vic Fangio and Ed Donatel, they want him to play the Khalil Mack role in this defense where he's twitched up enough to get around tackles on the edge and, and string together a few different pass rush moves, but he's also got, he can convert that speed to power and really wreck shop inside, outside, setting the edge. Missing him last year from week four on, it was a bigger blow to this defense than I think people realized because, I mean, you have a guy like Malik Reed come in that's, you know, still an undrafted rookie, still very much bright eyed and bushy tail wonder what the heck is going on, very much green behind the ears, so to speak. And then even Jerry Attachu, who's, you know, by this point, four or five year vet, he didn't really kind of come into the picture for another couple of weeks and then he didn't even really make an impact till down the stretch is when I would say about the time Drew Locke entered the fray, that's about when a tattoo started actually kind of getting his legs beneath him and figuring out the Fangio defense. But, but in between that gap, it was Vaughn Miller. And that's really it in terms of pass rush, a little help from Shelby Harris here and there. But Zach, that's one of the reasons why it, kind of, it took so long for Fangio's defense to really come together. The parts and the pieces by which he had envisioned this thing working out, they were just not, Bradley Chubb, his absence was a big part of that. Yeah, going from Bradley Chubb to someone like a tattoo or someone like Malik Reed, it's just a giant downfall and, uh, da- uh, you know, downward, uh, you know, downgrade, I should say. I couldn't think of the word for a second. And literally, you could say that about any other player. Chubb is a special, special talent, and that's why he was a first round pick. That's why he had a great rookie campaign. He, he brings just generational talent to the table. You think Khalil Mack, I think Demarcus Ware in his prime. Power, speed, leadership. He's just a great player, great teammate, great edge rusher. He has to clean up the edge work against the run a little bit. He has to prove he can be consistent in that department. But I loved watching him play his rookie season, and his absence last year was definitely felt. And I think coming back healthy this season, paired with the motivated Von Miller, paired with the year two of Vic Fangio and all the talent they have on defense, he's going to have a double-digit sack campaign. Could be anywhere from 12 to 15 to 17. He's going to have a big season, though. Big fan of Chubb. Man, the Broncos could really use that. Whether Von Miller, I mean, we don't know yet whether last year's kind of downturn or step backwards somewhat, at least I wouldn't even say just statistically, like Von Miller just wasn't quite the same player last year. We don't know yet if that's the trend, if that's the new normal, if he be in a couple of years now on the wrong side of 30, if that's what's the future holds in the 2020, or if it was an anomaly. And 
if that anomaly is was due in large part to not having because a, a, a compliment on the opposite side because if you think back from the time Von Miller entered the league and I don't say this to take away anything from Von it goes to what I'm about to say it goes to show you how important it is to have complementary pieces around you there no man is an island and especially in the NFL and especially on defense but when Von entered the league in 2011 he had Elvis Dumerville on the other side this was a double digit sack threat year in and year out was Elvis Dumerville in fact until Von Miller set the new mark in 2012, Elvis Dumerville tied or held, shared, I should say, the single season sack record of 17 sacks with Simon Fletcher for, I don't know what it was, three, four years. And then Von broke that in 2012. Then there's that one gap year when Von gets suspended and he gets hurt, which coincided with that was the year that, you know, in, in the offseason preceded Elvis Dumerville, Faxgate, he goes on to the Ravens. And so the Broncos, in desperation, bring in former Charger Sean Phillips, who, without Vaughn on the field for the majority of the season, somehow manages to get double-digit sacks in that year. If you guys can think back to 2013, he was really the only pass rush the Broncos had to speak of. After that, DeMarcus Ware, then, of course, Bradley Chubb. So Vaughn's always had that dynamic complement, which tells me, Zach, that if indeed Bradley Chubb is able to return to form, and I am inclined to agree with you, especially after seeing – this this video on Twitter, it's only going to make Vaughn better. It's only going to yeah. make them both better, having them each on the field at the same time. Yeah, it takes the pressure off Vaughn as well. He doesn't have to be the guy, and that's one thing I think he loved about 2018 is Bradley Chubb kind of stepped up and took hold of that, the other bookend pass rusher spot where you think about it, they used a first-round pick on Shane Ray. That was a disaster. That didn't work out at all. Shaq Bear, they never really unleashed his potential. So Vaughn has worked with young players, and he's always wanted that that Robin to his Batman, that sidekick. And he had it with DeMarcus Ware, but DeMarcus Ware was mostly a mentor. He was on the downturn of his career. Career. He was in his twilight years. Vaughn's always wanted that young guy, and he finally met his, if not his his match, then definitely one, just one level below what he can bring to the table. I'm not saying that Bradley Chubb is a Hall of Famer like Von Miller. He's a first ballot guy, but he can be right there when it's all said and done. When he showed it in 2018, butting up against Devon Curse's single season rookie sack record, I was blown away. It was an instant validation that the Broncos made the correct pick. The one thing that Vaughn and Chubb, not the one thing, but one thing, one primary thing that the two have in common from a historic perspective is both set sack records within their first couple of years with the team. Bradley Chubb, of course, set the rookie single season sack record of 12 and is now one of only 10 NFL players ever to post 12 or more sacks as a rookie. Didn't even get sniffed for the Pro Bowl. Didn't even Shocker. get really sniffed for the Defensive uh, Rookie of the Year award, which Shocker. I believe went to Derwin James, if I'm not mistaken. Meanwhile, Von Miller, who had a solid rookie year, I think he had a, either it was either ten and a half or eleven and a half sacks. He was good, but not great. That was the Tebow year. He was still getting his legs underneath him. Very productive as a pass rusher, but in 2012, his second year, that's when he that was his best statistical season, not counting 2015. But even 2015, from a statistical perspective, he actually outperformed. In 2012, in the regular season, what put 2015 over the top, of course, was his dynamic performance through the playoff gauntlet and in Super Bowl 50. So these two are very similar. They're opposite sides of the coin. They're sharing the same coin, two different faces of the coin. And it's going to be fun to see them back in action together. And, gang, we got a great show planned for you here tonight. We're looking forward to talking with you guys as well, seeing what's on your mind. We see the comments and the super chats coming in. We're going to get to you here, and we appreciate you guys, as you know. First, though, we want to – and by the way, Zach, I had my fan rolling right before we went live, and I forgot to turn it off. So that first, like, two minutes, guys, if you heard a little bit of a buzz in the background, I apologize. I had my fan going and had to turn it off. So apologies if that distracted you. But, gang, shout out to TG. We, I doubt yeah. that his, uh, you know, his family is, is listening or viewing this live. He was the one that was way into the Broncos, big part of the community. But just uh, holding him in our thoughts and prayers, his family, and uh, – you know, we're going to miss him, and we have missed him. Guys, a couple of quick matters of business. Make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter. This show, when you combine YouTube, when you combine Facebook, when you combine Apple Podcasts, CastBox, Stitcher, all the different podcast listening platforms, including social media, this show is growing exponentially. So we want to make sure all of our new listeners know how to connect with us at Huddle Up Pod on Twitter. The reason that's so important is we're always going to keep our YouTube audience informed with individual posts in the community if something comes up. But 
following the show on Twitter is how you make sure you do not miss anything. We're coming up on about 2,000 subs or uh, followers, I should say, on Twitter. So if you haven't followed the podcast, take care of that. And then while you're at it, follow at Mile High Huddle. And then, gang, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're in a position, <clears throat> check out the, the merch store, huddleuppod.com. Get your swag on. Get yourself one of these football priest hats. Get yourself a mask. Get yourself a hoodie, a mug. There's a little something for everybody. And if you're not in a position to patronize the merch store, it is all good. We're just happy to have you here in the stream with us, participating in this conversation. Three simple things you can do while you're here. Make sure you're subscribed. 40%. I was just looking at this earlier today, Zach, right before we went live, in fact. 40% of our listening audience is either A, not logged into YouTube, or B, not subscribed. So often... Got to change that. Yeah, that, that's got to that's gotta change. So if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. And no matter where you're watching this live stream, whether it's live actually or after the fact, make sure you like this video. And if you really love what Zach and I are doing here, share it out there and help the podcast, help the channel grow and reach new like-minded Broncos fans just like you. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. <laughs> All right, Zach, let's just welcome in those who've been hanging out in the chat. Goodness gracious, Stu, jumping in, showing some love. That's why he's a guy. Uh, TG, really appreciate the generosity, Thank you, Stu. And honestly, you know, TG, we talked about this. I don't want to bog the show down too much because people already are getting after us that we, we spend too much time uh, gushing over our community. But TG was a very outgoing and passionate supporter, not only of the Broncos, but of MHH. He, I mean, and he showed it on Super Chat. He was just a stud. And, you know, he would come at us if he disagreed with one of our takes or opinions. And he would always do so while showing love. He would do it on a Super Chat. Take exception to, you know, one of Zach's takes on <laughs> Garrett Bowles or yeah. something I might have to say about maybe Joe Flacco back early on in last season. So we're going to miss him. And our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. And, Stu, we appreciate that show of support and like you, we will be, uh, we'll all be mourning the loss of TG Zach. Yeah, I was, I'm still kind of gutted by that chat. It was just so sudden and I was not anticipating seeing some of that come across our screens yesterday. And, uh, he was a great contributor to the community. Uh, he was a great Broncos fan, but even more importantly, he was a tremendous person and, and the world was a better place because of someone like TG. Not to be cliche, not to be sappy. That's just what I hold true. That's just what I think. And like Chad said, even when he would disagree, it was never personal. There were no ad hominems. It was just, facts it was just debate it was just his opinion versus my opinion and we always had positive uh forward thinking discord and and you know what uh, i appreciate that chad appreciates that it's it's rare to find nowadays in the age of social media and, and tg kind of broke the mold so great guy and it's 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 so sad my thoughts and prayers are with him and his family and he also exemplified the hashtag state of being he was not yep. in denver uh he was in i won't say what city but you, many of you who knew him in the community know what city but he was in a neighboring state of Utah to Colorado. So proving that Broncos country is not a geographic location. It really is a state of being, and, and he exemplified that. So yeah. he's in our thoughts and prayers. And again, Zeus, thank you so much thank for, you. Yeah. for helping us to remember TG and for your support as always. What's going on to Duke? What's going on to Matthew, Travis, Isaac, Robert, Jody, Christy's in the house. What's going on? Good to see you. We are stoked to be able to talk with each and every one of you. Um, Glenn jumping in, showing some love on Super uh, Chat. Really appreciate you hearing in. this. In loving memory of our cat, Simon, who had a heart attack on my lap, <clears throat> excuse me, three weeks ago tonight while listening to the pod with me and passed away moments later. Goodness gracious. Wow. Hashtag our boy, hashtag 18 next month, hashtag he was an MHH fan too. I'm sorry to hear that, man. I really am. As uh, as a pet lover and a, and someone who has probably way too many animals, to be honest with you. <laughs> I got three dogs, and then my wife is, is a ranch girl. She grew up on a ranch, so I have a decent-sized little slice of land in my neck of the woods, and she's got goats back there. She's got chickens. Zach, she even surprised me not too long ago. I come home and there's a pig in my backyard. I go out to water my grass and <laughs> this awesome. dark shape that is way bigger than any of my dogs comes out of kind of a tree, the shade of a tree. And I'm like, I like jump like it's a pig. So we all have our, our bonds. And by the way, the pig, sweetest, cutest. It's a one of these pot-bellied pigs, the type where their bellies almost drag on the ground. And 
it has the sweetest little personality and we form our bonds with, with our pets to become part of our family. So Glenn, that sucks to hear my friend. We're, we're really sorry to hear that. Yeah, Glenn, I know you don't want to hear, you know, cliches right now and you want to hear just the platitudes, but I, I was raised around pets my whole life. I'm a huge, huge animal person. Uh, you know, a big part of me likes animals more than people. They, they are just family to me. They are, they are just a very big part of my life. I have a cat as well. And, uh, I hope that he lives till 18. I hope I can give him the life that you gave him. And, and I'm sure it was happy. I'm sure you had many happy moments watching the pod and just playing around with them. Cats get a bad rap, Chad. They are really uniquely <laughs> you know sweet in their own way they're good pets in their own way they're they're complete opposite of dogs com- completely entirely but yep. in their own way they're they're very fun pets to have so glenn i feel your pain man i'm very sorry to hear that you know the funny the thing i think of when it comes to the difference between cats and dogs is that line that robert de niro has in meet the parents when <laughs> ben stiller's character comes in and are you a cat lover and he's like oh, i'm more of a dog guy oh you, you know you need an emotionally shallow animal <laughs> You're that insecure, whatever he says. I, I can't remember the exact because cats, of course, they do actually make you earn their love and affection. Yeah. Whereas a dog, I mean, you know, they're going to love you no matter what. They're going to be excited to see you no matter what when you walk through the door, no matter what how you treated them. You know, not to say people mistreat their pets, but you know, cats they they're they're different uh, different animals. So, but by all means, I agree with you. Everyone, we've I, got our bonds with our animals, and and they're important. I have nipples, Gray. Can you milk me? Sorry, I just had to say that. <laughs> this, this is the first thing that came to mind when you brought that movie up. <laughs> Stu also jumped in early on Super Chat saying hi. I really appreciate you, my friend. Thank you. Really do. Really do. All right. We're not going to keep the Super Chat superstars waiting too long. But while we're still at the top of the show, I want to grab what James is bringing up here. And thank you for the Super, my friend. Thank We've you, got James. some things coming up with James here in the near future where Damn, we're planning on getting him a a little bit more involved in what we're doing. So it's going to be fun. He, uh, across the pond in the United Kingdom, he says, Bradley Chubb is going to be a man on a mission. So happy the Broncos found a way to get him. Hashtag woo. Hashtag let's go Broncos world. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting story, you know, not necessarily to derail the pod, but Hey, we're sitting here in the middle of freaking uh, the tail end of June. What else are we going to do? The story behind how Bradley Chubb, ended up as a Bronco is a unique one. And, uh, and, you know, they, they talk about the team brass. We heard it from Elway. We've heard of the Kubiak input and whatnot, but long story short, they really didn't expect Chubb who I think most draft Knicks, probably most teams viewed Chubb as the number one defensive prospect in the class, even though Denzel Ward ended up going one pick before him, the corner from Ohio state to Cleveland, which thus dropped Chubb into Denver's lap. And it was a gift horse they just couldn't, you know, look in the mouth, in other words. And I, to this day, you know, I have to maintain my, or at least have to admit that I was critical of that because I felt like the team needed to take a quarterback right there, right? There were some options, including Josh Allen, including Lamar Jackson, right? There were some options there, but they went with Bradley Chubb. And now you see why, Zach, they're reaping the benefits because, They ended up finding their quarterback through other means one year later in the second round in Drew Locke. And now you're glad that didn't get necessarily, who knows if it would have been a wasted pick, but now you're glad that you got Bradley Chubb on the roster, former number five overall pick. And I mean, if his first year, first full season with the club is any indication, some big things are in store. He just got to get back on the field, get work back. Cause right now he's in, he's in good workout shape. As you could see from that video at the top of the show, but Zach, there's a big difference between workout shape, gym shape, and football right. shape. Yeah, you know, it, it hindsight can be fun sometimes. The Broncos came away with in two years Bradley Chubb and then Drew Locke, as opposed to taking someone like Josh Allen, who I wasn't crazy about. I'm still not crazy about. It worked out in their favor. Some of us, including myself, maybe want to quit Nelson at that spot, number five overall. That was he's just an all pro future Hall of Fame guard. The Broncos always need offensive line help. But how could you complain about Bradley Chubb and what he's doing and what he's done and what he will do? I just remember, to add on to your point, I remember writing a story for 24-7 that the Broncos admitted there were zero simulations, mock draft simulations, in which Bradley Chubb was on the, the board at number five overall. That's that's how rare it was for a talent like him to drop to the Broncos' lap. And they've been fortuitous the last couple seasons with players falling to him. Look at Jerry Judy this year, Drew Locke last year, Reisner along with them. They've had a good track record, and, and some of it is luck. And, and luck is finally on John Elway's side in the draft. Let me grab this super from one of our superstars, Mike Evans, jumping in, showing some love. Appreciate you, you, my friend. 
every pod, you're here, you're in the stream, you're part of the conversation, and you're showing love on Super Chat, and we appreciate you, my friend. He says, which O-line within the division will be the biggest challenge for our D-line? Appreciate you. Well, thanks again, Mike. Zach, my answer is this. If it come, if it were just a straight-up offensive line question, I would probably say the Raiders. However, when you factor in the preternatural pocket perception and presence of Patrick Mahomes, yeah. I think when you really boil it down, it's always going to be the Chiefs who are going to be the biggest obstacle to the Broncos' D-line and, and front seven. It's not the Chargers, that's for sure. When they have, I think, Michael Schofield still starting for them. Um, the Raiders are very good. They're very big and talented. They just, with Derek Carr, like you said, as the quarterback, it can fall apart at any time. The Chiefs also have a couple tackles, including Eric Fisher, who are just Von Miller's kryptonite. So I'm going to give the nod to, for that reason, and Mahomes also to the Chiefs in the West. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Let's also grab. There's two other storylines I want to get your thoughts on that we will talk about here tonight which include what Lloyd Cushenberry had to say, well, his takeaways from Peyton Manning's little training he did, orientation for the rookies, and what he had to say specifically about something Lloyd Cushenberry himself asked Peyton in that setting about Drew Locke, and you know, we'll get to that. Also, what Brandon McManus told Mike Kliss with regard to is training camp going to start on time at the end of July? But really quick, I want to grab – one of our bona fide wow. superstars. Oh, dog! Is that Huddle Up Pod T-shirt? I can't tell. Can you tell? I can't. I don't. I, I'm not sure that it is. I don't think that it is. But either way, Eclipse Stormborn, longtime listener to the show. We love you. It's good to see you in the stream. Really appreciate Thank that you. generous super chat. He says, "Been missing the lives, but catching the recasts at work. Down to a one car household, so I'm usually making the runs around this time. But I have Father's Week off. Oh, cool." Love you guys. Hashtag let them hate. Hashtag state of being. Hashtag happy father's week. Well, same to you, my friend. And we hope things have calmed down in your neck of the woods. I don't know. I've, I've been trying to stay away a little bit from some of the headlines out there just because the fear porn right now is just out of control. But nevertheless, one of the last things I remember you telling us here in one of the streams, uh, we were thinking about you and worried about you a little bit just because of what you were doing to try and uh, – Keep things safe in your neck of the woods. But thank you, Eclipse. That's a good idea, too. You know, good dads deserve Father's Week, not just Father's Day. So, <laughs> Amen. Eclipse, Eclipse you're, uh, you're living good. We appreciate you. Amen to that. Uh, Miller707, it's good to see you as well, my friend. Appreciate you being in the stream. We got Mile High Six Sports, also a YouTuber, a, uh, you know, just kind of starting out with with his channel, Mile High Six Sports. You guys, if you get a, ch- a chance, check out his content. I don't know if it's any good. No offense, Mile High Six. I don't know if it's any good, but check him out. Passionate Broncos fan. And then, of course, we got the queen of MHH right here showing some love. She says they have created a highly competitive team. We are going to see guys fighting for starting roles. They will complement and have healthy competition within creating a winning playoff bound team. Appreciate that so much, Christy. And I think that's true. A highly competitive team, <clears throat> the Broncos this year, you know, they have a kind of a, a middle of the road strength of schedule, but if Drew Locke ends up being the truth and if Bradley Chubb comes back the way we think he is, and if Bryce Callahan comes back and starts providing a return on that $21 million contract, the stars could really start aligning quickly and those dominoes could fall very quickly for this team and they could be one of those worst to first type stories in the NFL. There's there's one each and every year, at least one. Last year, Zach, it was the Titans and it was the Bills, right? That shocked and stunned right. everybody kind of coming out of nowhere. Who's to say it won't be the Broncos this year? I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest they are a leading candidate for just that. It's a really good point that she made that competitiveness is driving the 2020 Broncos because no one is resting on their laurels. It's not club bend. It's not the Vance Joseph type of off seasons where players are just gifted jobs. You have to work for each and every one. And you look on offense, running back competition for the third down running back, wide receiver. There's so many there, not a lot of slots to go around. Tight end, it's packed. Even left tackle, they're opening a competition chat with Garrett Bowles and Elijah Wilkinson. They want competition all around. But what's satisfying to me, what is the one position? where there's no competition for once and that's quarterback which is the most important area so great point christy it's true and it's going to make the broncos a better team by having players the best players win those starting jobs well said and as we talked about on last night's podcast 
there are some in Denver media that are not content with the quarterback position that are stumping for the Broncos to go out and sign the likes of Cam Newton. And that's, there's, I have nothing against Cam Newton. I always thought that he was actually a underrated quarterback. I think he accomplished quite a bit during his tenure, although in Carolina, although his last few years have really been marred by nagging injuries. Nevertheless, Drew Locke needs room to grow. He doesn't need a, a superstar on the downs, you know, the back nine of his career like Cam Newton coming in and still in thunder. Like he just needs to have the room to grow. He he needs the message needs to continue to be from the top of the organization down that this is our guy, at least for now, and be given the room to step into and grow into this role that uh, you know, the Broncos have built that nest. Let him stretch, let him, you know make himself at home in that nest way up high in the, in the thin air of, of the Rockies. Yeah, and let him take his lumps, meaning throw interceptions, meaning have bad plays, have bad moments, without the fear that he's going to be yanked for a veteran quarterback. And if the Broncos wanted a veteran guy, they would have brought back Case Keenum. They would have signed one. If they wanted a better backup for Drew Locke, they would have drafted a better one. They signed a Jag and Jeff Driscoll, who is good enough to hold the fort if Locke gets injured for maybe a couple games, but not good enough to usurp Locke as a starting quarterback. So the, it's not just you and I saying it. It's how the Broncos feel. They've structured the entire offense season around Drew Locke because he is the guy. Cam Newton is not needed, no matter who calls for it. George jumping in, one of our bona fide superstars, and he's up there on the MHH Mount Rushmore. Very generous super, also yeah. showing some love in memory of TG. Really appreciate you, George, and it's good to see you in the chat, as always, Thank my you, friend. George. We got Bobby showing wow. some very big love and generosity to the channel, and also to James Campbell, whose birthday it is today. Let's see. He's seven hours ahead, so he's officially now where he is currently. It is no longer his birthday. However, where we are, it still is James' birthday. So happy birthday indeed to you, James. She yes. says, it has been amazing to have you on the chat. Thank you for all you do. MHH family loves you. Go Broncos. Indeed. James, you're a stud, dude. Hoping you're having a good night, my friend. James Champel. I like that. All right, um, Zach, let me get to this quick story here. But uh, this was an article that our Keith Cummings had at milehighhuddle.com. And it kind of, uh, we talked about this during one of the pods last week. Peyton Manning was asked to come in and address the Denver Broncos rookie class with a virtual Zoom call. Also, Troy Polamalu was a part of that same I don't they didn't talk together but part of that same meeting he addressed the rookies as well but we know that Peyton Manning talked about in that kind of training speech lecture whatever the the importance of treating every practice basically like it's a game trying to stretch those practices and get in mind and and get as much out of them as you possibly can as a player and then also just preparation in general you know study film study playbook study opponents self scout, all that stuff that made Peyton Manning legendary as his physical faculties were beginning to betray him and and go away due to age. Thanks to what he did between the years and his study and his preparation, he still managed to lead the charge of one of the, arguably one of, if not the most successful four-year periods in Broncos history. In that same Zoom meeting, Zach, they opened up the floor for players, these rookies, to ask Peyton, any questions if they had them? And let me just read this quote from Keith's story here on Cushionberry. He said, quote, a lot of guys, mostly offensive guys, had questions. I asked him out of all the great centers and offensive linemen he played with, what were some of the things that really slipped out and made them different and separated themselves from the other guys? Manning, unsurprisingly, used uh, co- former Colts center Jeff Saturday as an example of who he felt like exemplified that. And then he asked his advice about establishing chemistry with the quarterback, with Drew Locke. And here's what Peyton told Cushenberry. This is Cushenberry again, quote, just come in and just really try and learn what the QB sees so you can get on the same page. That's something that him and his centers had during the years. Close quote. That's from Lloyd Cushenberry. So Cushenberry, what I like from this, Zach, is he's asking questions. He's known for his being a really smart player really heady and centers have to be right there. They, they are the quarterback of the offensive line in, in a real sense. And they have to be basically the smartest guys in that starting five. 
And he's wanting to know, having not yet stepped onto a field that we know of anyway, with Drew Locke quite yet, he wants to know, hey, what, you know, what should I look for? What should I strive for? And Peyton Manning dropped some knowledge on him, and it's good to see him continuing to have that impact on the Broncos now going on the fifth year that he's been retired. Yeah, I mean, it's fairly obvious what he said. It's like get on the same page as your quarterback. Absolutely. And it's easier said than done because it takes repetition. You can be told it over and over and over again, but you have to be on the field, taking those reps, going through your lumps, going through your progressions. And that's what they'll do together. The The bigger point, like I mentioned on a previous pod, is that the Broncos are so lucky to have Peyton Manning be their their sounding board, be the guy they bring in to give advice, bring, be the guy they have Zoom calls with. No other NFL team is doing that, and you have – if not the greatest quarterback of all time, the second greatest quarterback of all time in my book, in Peyton Manning, a legend in Denver, giving you advice. And for someone like Cushenberry, who needs a little seasoning, he's not exactly Jerry Judy in the sense that he's an instant, day one, ready to go out of the box, plug and play guy. He needs a little work. He will start. So it's important that the message got through to someone like him, and he's parroting it out there to other players and other teammates, hopefully. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. I do think, though, there was, like you said, it's kind of like a what else is he going to say type of message to the center. However, there is one thing he said that I think has some utility specifically for Cushenberry, and that is his line about trying to see things the way the quarterback sees things. Because if you can connect and try to see the field and formations and all that through the quarterback's eyes, it's going to make your communication so much easier. You're going to check into things before he does. You're going to be sharing a brain. You're going to flow and just make things that much more seamless. And for a rookie who, again, because of the unique nature of this particular offseason that is unprecedented, he hasn't even been able to really get in the same room yet with Drew Locke. It's good to kind of orient him toward that from a mindset perspective, I think, Zach. Yeah, yeah. so much of the game is mental. What was that old uh, John Madden quote, I believe it was? 80% of the game is half mental. <laughs> and maybe it wasn't John Madden, but I always there's that sports cliche that goes around. Yeah. And it's true for the NFL. It, it's not just physical talent. You have to stay mentally sharp. And for the reasons that you just laid out, in an offseason like this where there's been no practices and everything is pushed back and up in the air, it's important that Lloyd Cushenberry is getting his mind right and absorbing that message from someone that he truly respects and he grew up watching and spent his formative years wanting to be like in Peyton Manning. Uh, James brings up here, Shaq Barrett was a big loss for 2019, but what's the longer-term projection? Chubb is a better bet over the next five years, which I agree with. Tampa have a loaded defense at all levels. So what I would say is this, when when it comes to Shaq Barrett, I think we all kind of knew what the Broncos had in Shaq Barrett. I'm not quite ready. As happy as I am, and was to see him succeed the way he did in Tampa and get to the pro bowl and make some money. I mean, for a former undrafted guy, it was great to see him get that, especially as a Colorado state guy, but I want to see him do it now two years in a row. I want to see him be a double digit sack guy. I want to see him continue to be a force. He's not surprising anybody anymore. And not to say that he was really shocking any opposing quarterback or offensive coordinator or whatever, but now that the NFL fully recognizes what he's capable of, he the onus is going to be put on him similar to what the greats all time have had to deal with, including Von Miller and DeMarcus Ware and Elvis Dumerville back in the day and Khalil Mack currently and guys like that. Once they know how good you are and they start diverting attention to you and they got all the tape and all the film on you and all the scouting reports, can you still find ways around that to produce an impact And I'm not saying that I don't think he's got it in him, but I want to see him do that before we crown him in in the sense of, oh, man, the Broncos made a big decision. They didn't need to draft Chubb. They had a guy that could have been just as productive in Shaq Barrett waiting in the wings. They could have used that number five overall pick on whatever other position. That's not necessarily true. you got to remember, Shaq Barrett was given many opportunities to start in Denver. He could never quite lock it down. Zach, he he started many games as a Bronco. He was never quite able to earn that full-time belief and support of whatever his coaching staff was around him. It just took the right, you know, set of circumstances and the right football environment for him down in Tampa for all those stars to align. 
Well, I'm not shocked like someone like Vance Joseph wouldn't give him a chance. I mean, there were so many personnel blunders under Vance Joseph's watch. But a lot of us were pounding the table for Shaq to start over Shane Ray. He was always the better player. He was by far and away the better pass rusher. Shane Ray brought nothing to the table, and the Broncos left Shaq Barrett in mothballs. And seeing Shaq Barrett's success last year, I, like you said, I was happy for him. He finally got his chance to start. He finally became more of a household name. He's on the franchise tag. He didn't get his long-term contract, and he will, like you said, if he produces for another year and he shows it's legit. I don't know if he has another, what do you have, 18, 19 sacks last year? I don't know if he has another 19, 19. type of season like that in him, but if he can do 12, 13, 15, he will get a fat contract. Good player. I wish him the best in Tampa Bay. I kind of disagree that their defense is good on all levels. They have a little secondary issues, I think, cornerback and safety. They're not really that that great there, but they're going to be a good team this year. I, I'm not questioning, though, or regretting the Broncos taking Bradley Chubb. He's an all-around way better player, way better talent, way better prospect than Shaq Barrett. Against the run, against the pass, he's a generational guy, whereas Shaq Barrett kind of just came up a little tougher. He had to pay his dues a little more. He offers some pass rushing juice but nothing close to the ceiling and the potential of Bradley Chubb. Buana, can you grab Christian and – thank you. Perfect. Because the stream on my side jumped Christian and Christie's other Super Chat. Christian jumping in, showing some love on Super Chat because thank he you, is Christian. a bona fide superstar. He says, hey, guys, I missed the pod yesterday due to my lifeguard training. That's right. Hope it's going well. He says, just taking a break from my online course. Happy to be back. We're happy to have you back. It's good to see you, dude. I yeah. hope everything's going well with that. Again, that was one of my dream jobs when I was a kid. I wanted to be a lifeguard. So props to you for chasing that down. I'll just live vicariously through your updates here in the chat, my friend. Appreciate that. And then Christy is showing wow. some big-time generosity. Queen. The queen of MHH. Letting it be known. She says, sending love to our community. Love you all. And that is just – that's quintessential Christy right there, Zach. I mean, and is there any doubt that Broncos country is the best, Chad? And the answer is no, no, there is not. It, it, it blows me away every time to see the support, not only for us, but like Christy showing for TG and for, for Glenn, who, who, people who lost and people who were feeling down and people who need to pick me up. Christy and our community, people are always there to provide that. And we are so, so thankful. And it's still, it still blows me away. So thank you so much, Christy. And thank you, everybody else. Hey, man, I want to grab this real quick from George. He was saying, after this week, I go back to a second shift. I'll only see Saturday and Sunday shows live, but we'll watch shows after work. Hey, man, that's all good. We'll look forward to being able to hang out with you on Sunday nights because, of course, yeah. Saturday nights is Mile High Insiders. We'll look forward to seeing you once a week on Sunday night, and we'll get our uh, George fix in then. So thanks for the heads up, and I'm glad you're getting that second shift right now. Um Miller 707 has a unique question. Do you think the Broncos players or staff listen to MHH? No, I really don't. You got to remember with, with football teams, one of the things they preach is block out the outside noise. And yeah. some players can't avoid it. And even some coaches can't avoid it. You know, they'll listen to talk radio between the facility and when they go home or they'll, you know, catch a blog when they're sitting on the John, you know, they'll thumb through Twitter or something like that. And they'll read their own press clippings a little bit, but Without fail, Zach, all 32 teams, one of the first things when they have their first team meeting of training camp is they are told, block out the media, don't listen, do not pay attention. Some of them do. And, uh, you know, it's hard to say exactly who those are. I, I have – I'll just put it this way. I have my suspicions on a few of them. But that's just not something, Zach, that they – and here, here he's saying, Perna had McManus on a show not too long ago. I was surprised. Yeah, and Perna does – Perno's content is so unique and phenomenal. He's got he's built up his own little legend because there's nobody like Brandon Perna and what he does, bringing the funny, bringing the raunchy funny, and uh, he's he's a he's a little cultural icon, right, in Broncos country. So props to him, um, Buana. Before we bring on the next one here, I wanted to see Zach if you got some a chance to see this piece from Mike Kliss on Monday. When, let me just read the headline. Quote, despite last week's virus spike, McManus believes Broncos training camp will start on time. I encourage you guys to go ahead and read this when you get a second. We'll probably have an article on it at MHH here in uh, probably by the time this evening is over with. But here's what McManus said, Zach. First off, he said, 
with regard to is camp going to open on time, July 28th quote. Yes, I do believe it's going to happen. Is what he said. And then quote, there's just so many questions that a bunch of guys had on the phone call. Uh, actually, I got to give you one little quick background. This is from Cliss's article. Having said that McManus said there's a ways to go in a short amount of time to make the camp environment as safe as possible for players and team employees. He was on a player rep call with union leaders last week. For those of you who don't know, McManus very involved for, on the player side for the Broncos with the NFLPA. Then here's his quote. There's just so many questions that a bunch of guys had on the phone call, and they have no answer for them yet, said McManus. The Broncos place kicker. He's going into his seventh year. But I think they're ramping it up. And then he says, even when we had a phone call the other day with the union, we knew there would be spikes again. Every state is getting better at testing, so it's inevitable that there would be more positive tests as stuff was opening back up. The question is, what risk do you take? Uh, what risk do you take it to that's comfortable for the players and their families and cities, or depending on what state, the fans? We're just trying to talk through it. The union and league have a lot of questions to answer in a short amount of time. We'll see if they can get a better grasp on how to handle everything in the coming weeks. But Zach, close quote, what I like about this is so many people are missing the point that, you know, and understandably so, people have been scared out of their gourds ever since this thing happened uh, third week of March when the you-know-what really hit the fan. People are missing, though, <clears throat> because of the fear porn nature of the media coverage on this particular subject of the word that shall go unnamed, people are missing the forest for the trees. They're missing the fact that, yes, there is a spike in new cases, but a strong reason for that, Zach, is the now – ubiquitous testing. Testing has gone up. Right. Testing availability has gone up. And so if you're actually testing a larger sample size of the population, surprise, surprise, you're going to end up having more cases confirmed. But again, if you look at some of the other tests uh, or the other data that's coming out, um, the last two days have been the lowest two days, Sunday and Monday, have been the lowest two days when it comes to deaths since April 1st. So there's a lot of reason to be optimistic there's a lot of data out there that I don't want to get into right now and bog down the show, but your thoughts on what Brandon McManus had to say about what, what obstacles the NFLPA is working through and the prospect of starting camp on time. Well, I, I think a lot of what he said is fairly obvious. It's no one knows anything right now. I mean, not even Roger Goodell, not the players, not the coaches are kind of taking a day by day, week by week approach to see where the issue is going to be a month from now, two months from now, by the time the season starts, um, there's going to be, a unique training camp, no fans, probably a unique season, no fans, but there's going to be a season. And I think that's what McManus was saying is that by all accounts right now, the NFL has given no indication that they're looking to postpone the season or move to a neutral site like the NBA is doing. There's going to be a season, but they're letting it play out week by week by week. And you know what, Brandon McManus, these guys are human beings before anything else. They are people just like you and I who have opinions. Some are less scared of the virus than others. Others like John Harbaugh, I believe, he said, no way can we have a season. He's a little more on the conservative side. They all have opinions. And McManus, I guess he believes that between testing and contact tracing and, and all these precautions a couple months, from now there's going to be a season probably no fans probably be weird for the players but we're going to have football in the fall and i think that's what everyone wants ultimately this also from the cliss article this is cliss writing here quote several protocol guidelines have already been established players will have their lockers spaced out at least one empty locker from each other with 90 players on the roster some bronco hopefuls may have to dress over in the field house there will be scheduled times and smaller groups <clears throat> assigned to the weight room and cafeteria. Positional meetings will be spaced with perhaps the occasional outside gathering. Now, all these precautions, understandably so, and yet out on the grass, dudes are going to be sweating on each other, banging into each other, tackling yeah. each other. And McManus points this out, quote, this is McManus again. I think the football will stay football. Some of the, concer some of the concerns some players had was we're doing all these guidelines through the whole facility what's the point of doing this? And yet we're still going to be playing football. Guys will still be hitting each other, but what they're trying to do is mitigate as much risk as possible outside of the football contact you're going to have on the field. And then close quote, here's Cliss again, though. One of the keys McManus said may be that the league and union are hoping to use a saliva based test that would get a quicker result than what has become the standard nostril swab test. Here's McManus again, quote, I think they're trying to figure out a way 
that makes the players feel comfortable with the staff at the facility every day with testing and trying to get a saliva-based RNA testing where you could do it almost every day. So the day you report, you do a test, and then you'd have the results that day, and it lets you know whether you can report to camp the next day, and you do that every day. It's not finalized yet, but I think they're trying to go more to the saliva base, and then also they would test antibodies every couple of days, which is a blood prick. They're talking through the saliva test right now. So, close quote. There, there are precautions that, that they're going to take. As, as he said there, Zach, they're going to try and mitigate as much of the outside risk as possible. But at a certain point, it becomes, as you said, testing, contact tracing. And then when there is a case, if and when it pops up, isolate and yep. you know make sure you're, the testing, if possible, is going every single day so that you can weed out and isolate the players that do need to be isolated so that the body of the team can continue to operate. Uh, the NFL, though, Chad, they're naive if they're going to think that they're going to mitigate the, the the virus down to no positive test results during the season or during training camp during the summer. They can reduce preseason games. They can space out the locker rooms. They can have all the testing they want. But it's an inevitability that some of these guys are going to catch it. There's going to be more positive cases. And if the NFL wants a season, they should hope that a lot of these cases get out of the way now as opposed to September. I mean, we talked about herd immunity. Yeah. Again, yep. I'm not a biologist. I'm not an, uh, a, a scientist. I'm not getting into that department. But the, the they have to resign themselves to there being positive cases. They've handled it. We've seen Von Miller. He's a healthy guy, and is he, he's not that old. We saw with Ezekiel Elliott. He's a healthy guy, world-class athlete. For the most part, it's not as deadly. Again, not to wade into those waters. It's not as deadly for these guys as so it would be for – for for 65, 70 year olds with underlying issues, world class athletes will respond to this virus better than other people. Yes. And I think the NFL knows that, and the media is trying to c- cover their eyes and shield their ears and ignore that fact. But that is simply the case. And I think the NFL is preparing for the season around that fact. Yep. But then you do have guys like John Harbaugh, bless his heart, who only has the best interest of his players and his employees and himself in mind, but. He's completely, completely uh, led by the nose, if you will, by whatever the current media trope is. And what's been the trope the last 10 days, ever since the media decided to get off other events and back onto the word that she'll go and mention, fear porn, fear porn, it's spiking. When, if you actually look at some of the data and, you know, for what it's worth, Nick Kendall does a great job of balancing this with his, because of his background in epidemiology on Twitter and stuff like that. So you know, he's he's more of an authority on the issue in terms of some of the nuances that go into it. But just remember, not every development right now with regard to this thing is is negative, is panic inducing, nor should it be. Right. There are a lot of positive things to hang your hat on. It's just it's not getting focused on for reasons that I don't even want to entertain right now on this podcast. So the good news here, the takeaway is. Brandon McManus is and who's engaged with the NFLPA on the regular. He's the rep for the team. Um, he is of the opinion that camp is going to happen on time. And if camp is going to happen on time, the season's going to happen. And as Zach said, there might not be fans, at least initially, but you're going to get football. And Christy, we'll get that hat up. We keep forgetting to get that done. I promise you that will be one of the next things we take care of is getting a huddle up podcast trucker hat going. And then also Zach, Eclipse is saying that was his huddle up pod shirt. Nice, very cool, dude. Send me Appreciate that picture, you, Eclipse. Send me that picture. We'll we'll sh- shout you out on uh, Instagram and MHH social media. We'd love to love to do that. So just email me milehighhuddle at gmail dot com. DM me on Twitter. We follow each other. Whichever is easiest for you. Andy jumping in on Facebook. We don't want to neglect our great Facebook listeners. He says, "Love the podcast, Chad and Zach. I'm listening to the country. In that sense, I'm worried that the NFL season won't happen this year. So many reasons." need to happen in a positive way that the 2020 season will happen. If the season is canceled, will you guys still be on the air? Thank you. Yes. And it's not going to happen. I'm just, it's, it's not going to happen. I know until we see it with our own eyes and we see him out on the grass, there's a part of all of us on one level or another. that's not going to believe it till we see it because this, these last three months have just been so topsy turvy, weird upside down world that we're all living in lately. But I really do believe it's going to happen. And, you know, if for some, if I'm completely got my head up my rear end and totally wrong on this, Zach and I, 
that's a bridge we'll cross when we get there. We'll figure out some way to keep the conversation going, some way to, to focus and feature the Broncos. I don't know what that would look like right now. I'm not focusing any of my time creatively into thinking, what will we do right. if there is no season? I just don't think it's going to happen. And it's not wishful thinking. Here he is. It's my huddle up pod shirt. I'll recrop the pick. Awesome, dude. Yeah. Send it to me. Eclipse. I want to, I want to shout you out my friend. And we thank you for supporting the, the cause as you know. All right, Buana, let me grab uh, who's next. We got Rick. Oh, Z- Zyka. Thank you. Zyka showing some love who has kind of come out of, uh, I, I, I don't want to, don't get me wrong. Zyka. I don't want to see you came out of nowhere. But you've really come on strong, I would say, Zach, the last month and a half, probably yeah. from like draft on two months maybe. Really strong, so consistent on Super Chat in the chat stream. We really appreciate it. He says, hashtag let him hate, hashtag gush away, hashtag state of being. Yeah, that's right. Usually it's that minority of, of vocal listeners that like to complain who listen after the fact that we just spend too much time. But this is why we show up and do this, guys. If we didn't. If it wasn't for the community, Zach and I would still just be getting together once or twice a week, recording a podcast, uploading it, just talking yeah. news, just uh, analyzing whatever the in, the issues are. This podcast has become what it is and become the animal that it has become, not just Huddle Up, but all of MHH's podcast because of the community. We literally show up here every night at six so that we can talk to the community. That's why we're here. So, of course, we're going to we're going to give you guys our attention and our props and and sh- show you our appreciation when the opportunity comes. We're never going to stop gushing over our fan base chat, over no. our listeners, over our, our our community. I mean, they can hate all they want. We've we've been called out for being positive, being too praiseworthy. I mean, the most ridiculous reasons. But those people who have a problem with it, they have problems on their own, and we we don't need someone like that in, in our community and our fan base anyway. So we will never stop gushing. We will never stop praising you guys, and we will never stop delivering these shows that are cathartic actually for Chad and I as well. Yep. Rick James showing some love on super chat. Really appreciate that. Rick. Thank you, Rick. This is a message to everybody, but especially our super chat superstars. If you're on Twitter, make sure you reach out and let us know who you are so we can connect and include you in our daily shout outs on social media. He says, thanks for the daily content. Do you guys know if there will be a training camp for fans this year? I would almost guarantee, Zach, fans are not going to be allowed at training camp this year. Like, wipe that off. That's the one thing. You can still keep hope that fans can be in the stadiums. That hasn't been decided yet. And even though technically fans at training camp hasn't been decided either, that's just not a bridge that NFL is going to want to cross because they don't really benefit from it. If it was a money issue, if it was a revenue issue, there would be a better motivation for the NFL to want that to happen. But – it's free for fans and it's as, as great as it is for fans and for the team to have, have everybody there in a unique situation like this, better safe than sorry. And that's the approach they're going to take. And hopefully they can make up for that by having fans in the stands when the games roll around. But you just got to get used to come to terms with the idea that fan presence at these actual events themselves, Zach, probably not going to be there at least initially. Yeah, there might not even be media there, Chad. It's going to be so constricted to just the players and the coaches and the training staff. And I even saw some mock-up of a helmet on Twitter that players could wear on the field where it's a full covering over their – it's a full helmet for their – it looked like Power Rangers. So there's no way in hell – that fans are going to be at training camp. I, I'm still a little wary about fans being in the stands in this season, in the regular season. No way for training camp, though. So it's unfortunate, but got to wait till 2021 for that. KP jumping in, showing some love, a bona fide superstar. Thank Appreciate you, Kevin. my friend. He says, did you see the video where a kid asked Cam Newton if he wished Von Miller a happy Father's Day? Hashtag, who's your daddy, Cam? Yeah, that one's kind of old. Like, that's a couple years old, isn't it? If I'm not mistaken. But yes, yeah, every year, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's timeless. It's quintessential. And if you guys haven't seen it, just Google it. It's definitely worth seeing. Dre, it's good to see you, my friend. Glad that you're being – glad that events are allowing you to be in the chat for a couple days in a row. Gary, good to see you, my dog. He says, competition makes you better. Who's to say competition won't make Drew better, which is a good point. It's a, it's a fine line, Zach, because on one hand – Let's say after his rookie year, did Peyton Manning ever have to compete for his job? No. He had to justify it. He had to continue to justify his job. But was he actually ever pitted in a a fair sense in an open competition? No. 
Because if that were the case, he'd be they, the, the coaches would be divvying out the reps equally to all the quarterbacks, let the chips fall. So when a guy becomes the guy, <clears throat> he does have to justify his job. Doesn't mean he's not still competing, but it's not quite the same thing. It's it's an odd football contradiction with regard to quarterbacks and right. all of the star players, to be honest with you, including Va- the Von Millers of the world and the Bradley Chubbs and whatnot, but especially as it relates to quarterbacks. Quarterbacks, like you just mentioned, they're in their own department. They're in their own category. Quarterbacks are held to different standards because they are the face of the franchise. The team goes as the quarterback goes. And in terms of Drew Locke, he doesn't need the external competition. He has plenty of internal motivation to be a great quarterback. He doesn't need a guy pushing him. He wants to be better on his own. He will take grasp of that mantle and make it happen for himself. He doesn't need a Cam Newton behind him or a a Case Keenum behind him. He needs just himself to get on the field and let him know and, and show what he's capable of doing. So that's where I disagree with that. It's different having competition with Royce Freeman than it is with Drew Locke. Real quick from Ian on Facebook. Could we use Jamal Adams? Well, hell yeah. Every team, we every team can Jamal use Jamal Adams. <laughs> but there are reports. Zach, you're probably a lot more on the, on the pulse of this thing because of his love for the Dallas Cowboys. But yeah, he – I read reports that he wants he's seeking twenty million a year, and then I heard that shouted down by a colleague of ours, Mike Fisher, who covers the Cowboys for SI, like I do for the Broncos. What have you heard on that front? Because even if it's not twenty million a year that Jamal Adams is after, you're going to have to give up compensation to the Jets to acquire right. him via trade. That's going to be a pretty penny. That's going to be a pretty cost. First, second round pick, third round pick at the very lowest. Then you're going to have to pay him to make him happy. Right. So what are you hearing on that front? Well, I know for a fact the Cowboys last year before the trade deadline, they were moving toward making a deal for Jamal Adams. They offered a first-round pick and their cornerback, Anthony Brown. And the Jets countered with a first-round pick and Zach Martin, who is a perennial pro Bowl, you know, all-pro yeah. guard. It was just too rich for the Cowboys' blood. They said, forget it, we have to pay Dak Prescott. That never happened. Jamal Adams wants to go to the Cowboys. He literally said to a fan, I'm trying. He liked a photo on Instagram of him uh, photoshopped in a Cowboys uniform. He wants to come home to Texas, but from what I'm hearing, it's not going to happen from Dallas. They have to pay Dak. They don't have a lot of money. And like you said, Chad, not only for the compensation, but for what he wants per year. He, he obviously wants to break the bank. He's a great, great player, but he's a, he's a box safety. He's not a Derwin James. He's not an Ed Reed. He's not much of a coverage guy. He's a better guy near the line of scrimmage. And you don't pay those kind of guys franchise quarterback money. So as good as he is, he'd be great on the Broncos. He'd be great on the Cowboys. But I think he's overestimating his worth just a little bit. It. Yeah, he's honestly he's he's probably a closer to a TJ Ward type strong safety box safety than he is yeah. Derwin James, who is everything from a box safety to you know deep third safety. He can rush the quarterback. We got Poppy jumping back in, wow. showing some generosity and love again on Super okay. Chat to commemorate and wish Chad Bailey a happy birthday. Go Broncos! Yeah, that's awesome. Bobby, we appreciate that, as you know. Thank you, Bobby. And, yeah, Champ, it's, you know, take a a quick two minutes to appreciate Champ Bailey. I mean, this is a guy that just finally, you know, what was it, first ballot, right? He's the first ballot Hall of Famer. His first time under consideration for the Hall, he gets in there and strengthens the Broncos' numbers. And it was cool, right? It was the same year that Mr. B got in. So, or am I – am I? yeah, that was last year. So – Anyway, sometimes these years run together covering these teams, and I have to separate, find ways to uniquely separate them. But Champ Bailey, Zach, was a phenomenal player to watch, phenomenal player to cover. It's sad that uh, he didn't get his this one's for Champ moment in Super Bowl Forty Eight, but he got the next best thing, and that's his, his Hall of Fame bust and the jacket and the ring. Yeah, I feel you on the year thing when this year has felt like three years in one. So it, it mm-hmm. gets confusing after a while. How old is Champ Bailey, though? What did he turn today? I'm interested to know. 40, 40 something. 40, 47, I will say. 48. 42. 42. 42. Wow, he's a young guy. I was way off. He's he's slightly older. Than, he's like one year, a year and change older than I am. Oh, so he's getting he's up there, dude. He's getting long in the tooth. <laughs> You're a young man, Chad. Don't worry. Let's grab Kenneth here, who's waited patiently. Do you see Lindsey and Gordon turning into that, turning into the Russell Wilson, Matt Flynn situation where one got paid, but the other forced their way under the starter position, like he always said. Maybe not quite 
obviously there's no way to compare it because it's quarterback running back, but still to your point, it wouldn't, we've been trying to tell you guys this dude, no running back ever who has crossed Philip Lindsay's orbit has been able to keep him off the field. Now he's a new father. He's even more motivated to go out there and earn. Now he is pissed. He told you guys he's pissed. He's trying to turn that anger into a positive outlook and an optimistic outlook, but still it did offend him. It upset him that the Broncos paid Gordon when he thought maybe that money was coming his way and deservedly should come his way. So Zach, to to answer the question, I could see it happening. Yes. In the general sense, the way Kenneth is explaining it, but Gordon, he's locked in for two years, no matter what 13 and a half of that 16 million is guaranteed. But I still think, and some even M- guys at MHH right now, if they're listening, there's one or two guys I can think of that are shaking their head thinking, no, nah, this is going to be Melvin Gordon, then Philip Lindsay. I'll believe that when I see it. And you know what? To answer the question, it, it's apples and bowling balls because it's quarterbacks versus running backs. And like I mentioned a few minutes ago, quarterbacks are in their own separate category. They're in their own stratosphere. They're held to a different standard. That being said, though, it's interesting the Broncos gave Gordon a two-year contract. That could coincide with Philip Lindsay hitting restricted free agency. So even if Lindsay has a good season this year, he might not get paid by the Broncos. They might just not tender him. They might let him go. They might not want to. I All I can know is this. I watched the Broncos Chargers film from last season. And when I saw Melvin Gordon in that second game, he did not impress me that much. And, and for my money, when Philip Lindsay ran between the tackles, he was more explosive. He was more powerful. He was creating more yards after contact. Lindsay is way more of a workhorse than a lot of Broncos fans want to give him credit for. And he will show that this season. And it applies to even him, but let him hate. Talon says, Zach, you were right. It was John Madden, but it was 90% men. Ah, uh, got you. Oh. Close uh, enough. Quick co- comment here from Keith. I'm excited about Albert O and Fant and Sutton's red zone threats like crazy. Thoughts about them all being on the field at once. We're excited about that too. And, I mean, it's really a, an embarrassment of riches. It's a smorgasbord for Pat Shermer. It really is going to come down to Drew Locke being that savvy point guard that recognizes the mismatches be pre-snap. It has the stones to push the ball when it needs to be pushed, but also the discernment to know when, you know, I need to go elsewhere, not forcing it too much. He'll have some moments where he forces it and he has to learn from that and bounce back. But can he walk that razor's edge of being a really savvy, prolific point guard? I think he can, and I think he will. And I think he got Pat Shermer and Mike Shula into his career at the penultimate perfect moment. Yeah. Sky's the limit. Yeah, and someone like Cortland Sutton, where last year uh, you can tell the chemistry was there, the connection was evident. He threw it up, and Cortland Sutton is just so great where he would come down with it. There is that trust level, that comfort level that he has already. Noah Fan, he was developing and blossoming as the season went on. He has big, big bodies for the red zone, and that when they move the ball there in that red area, when they can convert touchdowns and not settle for field goals, that's going to make Locke a more confident player in the non-red zone, the other parts of the field, in his other parts of his game. So you can never have too many weapons, but having the size, the speed, the, the well-rounded complementary receiving group on the Broncos this season, it's going to do wonders for Locke's confidence and his development. All right. I haven't had to do this for a minute, but the chat dr- uh, jumped one of our superstars, Duke, that I'm going to put in here. And this is Ian actually getting his question in. Um, via Super Chat. We grabbed it on Facebook, but thank you for the support, my friend. You know we appreciate you. you. Zach, if you will begin to grab Ron, one of our bona fide superstars questions, I'm going to input this one from, from Duke, and then I'll catch you on the backside of Ron. Yeah, Ron jumping in with 499. Thank you so much, Ron. We definitely appreciate that as always. Hey, Bonafide buddy. superstar. Uh, he says, Hey guys, uh, what are your expectations for Sternad this year? Also, do you see Bassey creeping up the depth chart, possibly surpassing Adam? To, I'll answer the second question first because it's more, it, it just jumped out to me. I, I think Bassey will make the roster and Yadam will be playing safety this season. So by, by virtue of that alone, he, they will both be on the roster and you can, you can make the argument that Bassey will be higher up on the depth chart at corner than Yadam will be at safety. To answer the first question, Cernad, and this is just my opinion, Chad, you can you can have a different take if, if you feel like it. I just feel 
He's going to start the season as a rotational player. He's going to be working in and learning the, the scheme and the system, hopefully staying healthy. And then by midseason, if he shows enough, he will be starting. He will be inserted into the lineup, just as A.J. Johnson was last year, just as Mike Purcell was last year. He will be the missing piece of this defense, a three-down linebacker who can cover sideline to sideline, can cover tight ends, cover running backs. He will be your long-term starter if he stays healthy opposite A.J. Johnson. He will make Todd Davis expendable, and I personally can't wait for that. Here's what I think of Sternad, and it's we had an article at milehighhuddle.com over the weekend. It was actually something motivated or brought on by me going back over some of the quotes from when the coordinators spoke two Thursdays ago, and it was something that Ed Donatel said that I actually missed on the first pass. And he talked about three traits that Justin Sternad brings to the table. Unique traits, I would argue, this is me making a leap. This isn't necessarily what Ed Donatel said. But I would say three traits that the Broncos coveted in him. And by knowing these three things I'm about to say, you can kind of project how the team likely envisions him being interjected into this equation. And that is speed, explosiveness, and adaptability. Those are the three things. So – I think he's going to have a role on this defense sooner than than you might think. The wild card to me, Zach, is Todd Davis is in a contract year, and some veterans, man, they just find a way to turn it on in a contract year. Yeah, It's not absolute. It's not something you can count on and guarantee. But I think, I think Todd Davis is going to have a little something to say about that. But even still, Sternad is going to see the field by midseason. I think you're going to start seeing Sternad and nickel and dime alongside, you know, when it's nickel, alongside A.J. Johnson, when it's dime, maybe as the solo linebacker on the field, we'll see. And Bassey, I just want to see him on the field first. I want to see him in the orange and blue. He's had some really interesting tape at Wake Forest, smaller, more diminutive corner, 5'9", if I'm not mistaken. I want to see him in action before I I get too far ahead of putting the, the cart before the horse, if you will. And, again, thank you, my friend, so much. We really do appreciate you. And Duke, his comment got cut off, so I'm going to read it here. Very generous super chat. Thank you, my friend. He says, Chad and Zach, I'm sure I speak for everyone in this MHH household. Thank you for all that you do. Even on days I can't or others can't catch you live, we always watch the next day. That is very sweet, my friend. Really appreciate you showing some love, showing some support, and uh, super chatting it all adds up and means everything to Zach and I and allows us to be here for you each and every night, six to seven o'clock hour. And even right now we're seven minutes over. We got to start winding it down, but we're not counting minutes. That's why we're over. Like we're, we're not paying attention to that. It flies. And, and Chad and I, we say it all the time, but we genuinely love interacting with you all. We, we love the banter. We love the questions. It's, it's not work for us. It, it's, it's pure fun and pure entertainment. We love doing it. So thank you so much. Duke. We definitely appreciate that. Terry showing some love up in Canada, bonafide, exemplifying the hashtag state of being. He says late to the chat, but I've been listening and uh, he's wishing James a happy birthday. Very cool. Really appreciate that, my friend. Thank you, Terry. We do have to start getting out of here. Let me just make sure we're not missing anybody. I know that there was a super here from Eclipse confirming that it was his huddle up shirt. He did it on a non super and then he did it on a super. Oh, Zach's in the house. We're going to grab Eclipse. Zach's in the house. Good to see you, my friend. Hope you're no longer under the weather and you're back feeling yourself. Appreciate the super chat. He says, I have a question. So if Chubb bounces back, makes Vaughn better and Jarrell Casey brings pressure in the middle. Our most offenses screwed. I really believe Vaughn will be himself with Chubb back. Yeah, I mean, if it all works out the way the team hopes it works out, you're getting the type of benefits you had in that 2015 defense where you got Vaughn and Chubb on the outside representing the Vaughn and Ware of 2015. And then on the inside, you got Shelby Harris and you've got Jarrell Casey pushing the pocket leaving quarterbacks nowhere to go. That's what the Broncos were able to do with Malik Jackson, Derek Wolf in his prime that year. So that's what the Broncos are hoping this, you know, particular personnel collection in 2020 is going to do. And I think your inclination is right, Zach, especially if Chubb does bounce back, which all sides point to that. 
You know, Malik Jackson was great, but they never, Von Miller never really had a guy in the middle who can push the pocket like Jarrell Casey. You're talking about a five time pro bowler who is so deadly against the run, so deadly as a pass rusher. He's going to help collapse pockets and force quarterbacks to go left and right meaning right into the arm of, of Bradley Chubb or right into the arm uh, of Von Miller. So it's going to be good for the defense. It, it, I wouldn't say all offenses are screwed, though, because you have the Mahomes who can make plays out of nowhere. You have Lamar Jacksons of the world who have escapability. Some teams will scheme around the Broncos. It, it's the reason they're not going to go 16-0 this year. Uh, other offenses, like maybe like the Titans with a very flat-footed Ryan Tannehill, they're going to be in trouble. Maybe Tom Brady in Tampa Bay, Drew Brees in New Orleans. Those offenses will have struggles with the Broncos' pass rush, but they're going to be deadly this year, and the pickup of Jarrell Casey just put them to a new level. And for a seventh-round pick, how do you not still love that? Amen. All right, guys, we got to wrap it up for tonight. Thanks to each and every one of you for joining us live. You know, you guys keep us coming back for more each and every night. Make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. Also, while you're at it, at Mile High Huddle. And do not forget, this is a big do not forget to follow my partner here, Zach Kelberman, at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad and Jensen. And guys, before you X on out of here, we're going to X on out just like you. But before you do, Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to share this video out there. Use your social media. Share this video out there. There is a lot more Broncos fans out there, believe it or not, that aren't aware of these nightly podcasts and the community that we have, this thriving, living, breathing community that we all value so much. So sharing this out there to them, friends, family, and even just people you're connected with on social media, we can bring them into the fold give them the same absolution and answers to their burning Broncos questions. But Zach, you and I are off tomorrow night. It's going to be building the Broncos, but in the meantime, dude, just have a, hope you have a great start to your week. Uh, you as well. And uh, I say it every podcast, Chad, but hopefully we have some news on Wednesday to go over, maybe some sort of roster news, maybe a season update. Just I'm crossing my fingers as always. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. We'll be back, Zach and I, Wednesday night, the usual time, 6 Mountain, 8 Eastern. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We will talk to you then. Mile high salute to our Super Chat superstars, and a special thank you to Buana Beast for holding down the fort. We'll talk to you guys Wednesday. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.